Welcome to the 2020 Awana Trek lesson series. Please have a notepad ready to take notes and write down any questions you'd like to ask the teachers in class. Today's lesson is 2-1 in your books, titled The Adversary. We'll be covering Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, as well as a number of other scriptures, so follow along in your Bible. This is going to be a topical study, which means that we're going to be jumping around a lot in the Bible to get a full picture of who Satan is and what his significance is in creation. While we won't be covering everything, your teachers are open to questions. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Verse 3. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, what we're seeing here is the temptation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden by Satan. The topic of Satan looms large over scripture. After all, most of the Bible is the story of how God acted to reverse the damage that Satan is about to do here in the Garden. That said, there are seven critical things that you need to understand about the devil. Number one, Satan is the enemy of God. The word Satan, or Shaitan, is a title that means adversary. Satan's actual name is given in scripture as Lucifer, but his title is literally the one who withstands. We can see this in 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So, Satan opposes the law and the will of God, and does everything he can to subvert the designs of God. For that reason, we're told in Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Because, as verse 12 tells us, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Satan is the original rebel against God's law and is the starter, or the reason, for the fall of creation. In Revelation 12.9 we read, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Which brings us to our next point. Number two, Satan is a fallen angel. We see this in Luke 10.17-20. The seventy-two returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Verse 18. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Verse 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The fact that Satan is described as a spirit here means that he's not physical like we are. It also means that he certainly isn't a snake. If he were a snake, he wouldn't have been able to enter Judas like we see him do in Luke 22, 3. Verse 3. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who is of the number of the twelve. When Satan does appear in scripture, he takes the form of an anointed cherub, which is basically a class of super angel. We see this in Ezekiel 28, 13-15. You were in Eden, the garden of God. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. Verse 14. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You are on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. Verse 15. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. From this, we get the impression that Satan was once the pinnacle of God's creation, at least the pinnacle of his angelic creation. And yes, God created Satan. But, just like humanity, Satan was created without sin. And the scripture says that Satan was blameless in his ways until unrighteousness was found in him. And we see this fall in Isaiah 14, 12-14. 
Verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Verse 13, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So Satan falls from grace sometime after he was created. From Isaiah's words, we get the distinct impression that his sin was pride, arrogance. Satan was among the highest of the angels, but he sought to make himself equal to God. For this crime, he was cast out of heaven. Anyway, getting back to his nature, Satan is a spiritual being, a fallen angel formerly of high standing with God. This means that he isn't a snake. So why is a snake talking to Eve then? Most likely, Satan is possessing a snake, like what happened to the pigs in Matthew 8, 31 through 32. Verse 31, And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. Verse 32, And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. So, not a snake. In fact, in appearance, Satan actually looks the same as his angelic brethren. We see this in 2 Corinthians 11.14, which reads, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Number three, Satan controls the corrupt system of evil in the world. If you recall, Ephesians 6.12 reads, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Note that the verse says, we do not struggle against flesh and blood, which means we struggle against the spiritual. This means that everything listed in this verse refers to a different rung in the hierarchy of demonic spiritual power. The image is a rough breakdown of those categories, but simply put, demons have a hierarchy. And we know from scripture that this hierarchy has a lot of influence over how sinful man acts. This can be seen clearly in 2 Corinthians 4.4b, which reads, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. This means that unsaved human beings are captive to the will of Satan. The way it's stated in scripture is that they are of their father, the devil. Or as it's put in John 8.44, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is called the god of this world as a statement of the authority he wields over the minds and hearts of the unsaved. Number four. Satan is still under God's authority, so he can't do everything he wants. Though Satan is terribly powerful and wants to destroy you, his power is limited. This is because even the authority Satan has is delegated to him by God. This fact is best seen in the story of Job. In Job 1, 9-12, we read, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Verse 11, But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Verse 12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So we see that whatever authority Satan has is received from God, with God's express permission. This means that Satan has to ask God's permission to harm you. And this hasn't changed by the era of the New Testament. We see Jesus say in Luke 22, 31 through 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Verse 32, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So scripture is pretty clear on the matter. Satan is limited by God. Number five, Satan is a deceiver and a tempter who wants to destroy you. When Satan attempts to deceive or tempt you, he uses the same tactics every time. It's the same for Jesus in the New Testament as it was for Eve in the Garden of Eden. To Eve, Satan said, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And in the case of Jesus, we see, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. This is Satan's main line of attack. He always tries to get you to doubt God's word. It's the same with Jesus as it was with Adam and Eve. He'll come to you with scripture, 
But then he'll say stuff like, Did God really say that? Did God really call you his beloved son? Why is he allowing you to starve in the desert then? And in both cases, the defense is to remember and believe God's word. Both Eve and Jesus quote scripture. The major problem with Eve's defense, as we'll see in the coming weeks, is that Eve misquotes God, and Satan uses that to trick her into disobedience. He didn't have nearly the same luck with Jesus, though. The Son of Man punted Satan like a badly inflated football. Speaking of which... Number 6. Satan's power was broken at the cross by Jesus. We see this all over the New Testament, honestly, but especially in Hebrews 2.14 which reads, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. So, Jesus' death on the cross paid the price for our sin, and his resurrection was the first of many resurrections, including our own, so he also broke the power of death. Taken together, this means that Jesus destroyed Satan's power over every Christian at the cross. But, Jesus' victory isn't quite complete yet. Number 7. Satan's ultimate destiny is hell. When Jesus returns again, he's going to put an end to Satan's reign forever. We see this play out in Revelations 20.10, which reads, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So, there you have it. That's Satan from a biblical perspective. Now let's have a brief recap of the seven things you need to know about Satan. Number one, Satan is an enemy of God. Number two, Satan is a fallen angel. Number three, Satan controls the system of evil in the world. Number four, Satan is limited by God. He can't just do what he wants. Number five, Satan tempts, deceives, and destroys human beings. Number six, Satan was finally defeated by Jesus at the cross. And finally, number seven, when Jesus returns, Satan will be punished in hell forever. So, we study Satan for two reasons. Firstly, because we need to know what type of battle we're actually fighting. A spiritual battle, consisting of a struggle to believe God's truth in the Bible. Satan constantly tempts us to reject, ignore, or twist the truth of Scripture. If we are to be successful in life, we need to be careful not to give in to these temptations. Second, we need to recognize that there is a force behind the evil of this world. It isn't even close to random. But ultimately, evil is doomed. Satan is doomed. And that is an encouraging thought. 